टाइप इन फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ तो वेलकम टू द स्पाइन स्मार्ट लेक्चर सीरीज टूडे वी हैव वन ऑफ द बेस्ट इन द फील्ड डॉक्टर अभय नैने सर ही हैज बीन माय मेंटर माय गुरु and uh, one of the biggest uh, inspiration for the lecture series that we have been conducting since the last two months uh, thank you very much sir for uh, sparing your precious time for the scoli part because nobody teaches scoliosis better than you just a brief about our series from uh, dr harshil patel who is in uh, uh, my fellow team member yeah thank you thank you dr ijay uh, first of all a very warm welcome to dr abhay nene one and only and uh, thank you very much for spending time sir from your schedule so sir uh, we have started this lecture series that is uh, that is a uh, spine smart since last one month wherein we take every lecture every week uh, on vendors day the topics are of basic spine diseases which are in context to orthopedic pg theory and practical exam so till now we have covered pid spondylolisthesis cervical myelopathy spine trauma lastly priyank sir took the lecture on spinal tumors and uh, now today uh, we are going to learn scoliosis from you sir so without wasting much time i'll uh, just uh, ask you to share your uh, uh, vijay uh, just uh, share the screen for the lecture ahead yes so i think it's a great initiative and uh, you know spine gets always neglected so um, Uh, you know, it's a good thing that we are uh, you all are doing this now for everybody. Yes, yeah, I, am I good now with the screen? Yes, yes, yes. Sir. yes sir. So um, you yes, know, sir. right up front, you should know that uh, scoliosis is a long case, and I call it the gold medal case. Like if you get scoliosis in your exam, there's a very very high chance that you can be one of the toppers because it's a very um, uh, examiner friendly and student friendly case because they're very specific questions, specific answers. You know it, and then you're done. There's no confusion no hanky panky no one can pull you on the sides uh, however when you see something like this often you get confused because you have not been exposed to a lot of this in your uh, uh, during your post graduation and you start wondering is this uh, kyphosis is this scoliosis is there i can see that bend on the back what am i going to say is this congenital is this idiopathic is this neuromuscular now uh, this is a rhetoric it's a, a symbol that suggests that uh, Uh, even the symbol of orthopedics is actually ortho is straight and pedos is child so it's about talks about scoliosis and the symbol is actually correcting a scoliotic tree using a the simple sublaminar wire technique right so um, we we are all bound to know scoliosis if you are orthopedic surgeons and uh, uh, that's what I, that's what we are here to discuss and uh, right at the outset i must say that if there are any questions uh, the just unmute yourself and stop the talk and ask the question because you may forget it later so any curve that's uh, any lateral curve that's more than 10 degrees is been defined as uh, scoliosis and uh, this is the srs definition and it still uh, holds true so which means that you might find kids with x rays that show like a 5 degree curve uh, you would still not call that scoliosis the problem with this definition is that there's a 10% measurement error which is uh, not only inter observer but even intra observer so the cob method has a 10% error and hence uh, however you may say uh, you know that you're convinced that this is a uh, 10 degree scoliosis actually it could be even a uh, like a 8 or 9 degree scoliosis so uh, it gets a little difficult to actually land that mark but more or less it's a good working definition it's at least what you need to know uh, in your exam now we see scoliosis as a as a curve right we look at the kid from the back and you see an s shaped curve then you call it a scoliosis but in reality you must know that scoliosis is a three dimensional deformity so it's time now that all of you start looking at scoliosis not like a, a c or an s but as a twist in the spine so think of it that the spine is like a bunch of carom coins that have been stacked one on top of the other and you start twisting these coins and then they spin out of their uh, you know their center of rotation and that's where they go out so it's not only an s but it's actually a twist in the spine and the twist leads to a you know something that looks like an s so when you look at the child from the back you see an s but in 3d it is actually a, a you know a twist and uh, so there is a sideways deformity there's a front and back deformity also which is invariably a hypokyphosis not a hyperkyphosis so the term kyphoscoliosis is actually a misnomer there is no kyphoscoliosis 
in idiopathic scoliosis. If there is a kind of a scoliosis, it's more likely that it's a neurofibroma or a neuromuscular scoliosis. So, uh, very rarely in your scoliosis uh, cases would you see a genuine kyphosis. What appears as a bend, like in this girl, you, you know, you feel that there's a kyphosis. That's actually a pseudo bend. It's the rib hump. And when you palpate the spinous processes, so you drag your thumb down the spinous processes, you will see actually that the spine is flat. So the normal thoracic kyphosis actually has been lordosed or hypokyphosed in this process of twisting. And uh, uh, it's a pseudo kyphosis rather than a true kyphosis. And uh, this is actually how that rotation looks. So if you see this image here, uh, the, the stack of carom coins here, you'll know what I'm saying. There is a indeed a twist in the, you know, the entire vertebrae. And that twist actually pulls the ribs out because the ribs are attached to the thoracic spine, to the transverse processes and the bone. And the ribs then pull out, giving the appearance of a round back, right? So this, is, this picture should always stay with you in the mind. So uh, when you think about this, you will also know that uh, the, the rib hump or the you know, apparent kyphosis is on the side of the convexity because the twist actually happens on the side of the convexity. So this is an important image when you think about um, you know, planning your surgery, which side to derotate the rod, uh, you know, which, how to pass the screws. If this image is in your mind's eye, uh, you will normally get it right and you will stop looking at scoliosis as a one-dimensional sagittal plane deform or a coronal plane deformity, right? Now, here is an interesting, um, you know, diagrammatic. Uh, all curves actually start as a little C. So the spine is straight and a little C happens. Uh, we don't know why that happens. That's why it's called idiopathic scoliosis. But when that happens, as the C grows from the left to the right, a point comes when the spine starts to fall off. And because of the body's natural writing reflex, the rest of the spine, because the spine is actually a flexible structure. So the rest of the spine tries to bring the you know, bring the head back on to the center of gravity. And that's where the compensatory or the lower curve develops. So what starts off as a C would eventually end up as an S in an attempt to balance the head on top of the spine. Sometimes instead of an S, it turns out to be one long C. But ultimately, the body does something to get the head back down. And hence, you have a primary curve and then a secondary curve after that. So uh, uh, coming to some definitions. So when, when you look at this, you would, you would say that, it, well, yeah, this is the culprit. This is the curve that is really the culprit. And these poor curves had to come into play to uh, save the body from, you know, falling off or from misaligning from the center of gravity. And hence, they are really not the culprit. So this culprit curve is actually called the structural curve. So a structural curve is a curve that has got a permanent change. It's a, it does not straighten on bending. And uh, then it will have some inherent or intrinsic changes like uh, rotation or like, uh, you know, a flattening of the spinous process or even sometimes wedging of the vertebral body. Uh, it's also defined as a curve which uh, on lateral bending is asymmetric, which means that on left bending, it may, uh, you know, it may uh, correct by 10 degrees, but on right bending, it may correct by 30 degrees or it may exaggerate by 30 degrees. So uh, a normal spine equally bends on both sides, but a scoliotic spine which bends unequally that part of the curve is called a structural curve. It's a little complicated to decipher. So the best way to answer the structural curve is a curve which is a fixed curve with intrinsic changes like rotation of the vertebra. Um, of course, today, which is in the last 20 years, Lenke has given a definition for a structural curve. You need not uh, abide by that definition. Many of your examiners may not, may not be fans of the Lenke classification. You may say that according to the Lenke classification, X, Y, Z is the definition of a structural curve, but the the term structural curve is not, it's an English language word. It's not a spine word. And it means that it's a curve which has changed its structure. It's a curve where the part of the spine has changed its structure. And uh, what follows is a non-structural curve. It's a part of the spine that's actually uh, completely correctable. So it's, it's a curve that has come into play just to balance the, the spine because of this unchangeable structural curve. Is that clear? I hope that's clear to everyone. If it's not, please unmute and ask. What about major and minor curves? So I'm bringing these terminologies out because they, they can get confusing because they're a bit overlapping. Uh, so there's, there's structural, non-structural. There's major and minor, which is again an in English language word. Major means the bigger one and minor means the smaller one. So it's as easy as that. A curve that's larger amongst the two is called a major curve and a curve that's smaller amongst the two is the minor curve. And hence, if there are two equal curves, it would then be a double major curve. 
So the terminology double major is something where there's no minor because both are equal. So like this, you know, this X ratio is a 61 and a 66. You would call both these, uh, you know, major curves. So this becomes a double major. While here you have, you know, the red one is the major and then the other two are minor curves. Okay, I hope that's clear also. So there's structural, non-structural, major and minor. Then there's compensatory curves. So compensatory curves are curves which, uh, as we discussed, are the ones that come into play to harness the head on the shoulders or the head on the you know plumb line when there's a strong structural curve. So it's a curve above or below the main curve or the major curve, which uh, uh, is formed to maintain the normal body alignment. Okay, and this eventually could become a structural curve, which means that if that has been there for a long time, it may actually develop its own changes and it may you know exceed a certain degree and it may stop uh, bending symmetrically. So. There's no doubt that uh, all compensatory curves start off as, um, uh, you know, as uh, non-structural curves, but they may end up as structural curves. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a definite possibility. Like you see here, there's a progression, you know, here the lower curve is non-structural clearly, but as time goes, it starts getting its own character and its own, um, you know, own body. And then finally it becomes a big structural curve, if you may. And uh, then what is a fractional curve? Okay, once again, it's a English language definition. A fractional curve is a curve that's a part of a, 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 a fraction of a, of a hemisphere, actually. So when you say something, when you call it a curve, you mean it, it has to have at least a 180 degree or at least half a circle. That's what you call a curve. So if it's not completing that half of the circle, like you see in the picture on the left, that would be a fractional curve, which means that this curve does not have a lower end vertebrae in, in a way because, uh, you know, all the vertebrae are tending or tilted towards one side while, I mean, the difference between the curve here and the curve there is what we are talking about. Invariably, the fractional curve is at the bottom. So if you have a very low apex of your main curve, the, you know, the lowest curve below that is invariably a fractional curve. And fractional curves are more of nuisance values because they are hard to measure, hard to even decipher. Because, uh, you know, this curve is very apparent. You can see a C. You can see the beginning of the curve and the end of the curve. But here, you, you can miss this curve, actually. Because it doesn't even look like a curve. It looks like the tail end of this curve. When in reality, it's actually going the other way. So, fractional curves are something... Uh, you should keep that definition in your head. So, once you know that there's some something like that exists, you'll start looking around for it. Okay? Right, then, so we talked about structural, non-structural, major, minor, uh, complete and fractional curves, compensatory curves. What is decompensated curve or what is a decompensated spine? So uh, maybe I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to relabel this slide as a decompensated uh, sl uh, spine because a decompensated spine is when you uh, drop a plumb line from the uh, C7 spinous process, which is the vertebra prominence, which is the most prominent vertebra you feel at the base of the neck and you drop that line down, it ideally should cut in the natal cleft or the uh, butt, butt cleft. But if it's off the butt cleft, it means that the spine is off-centric. And uh, this is a decompensated spine. And this, in a way, is a red flag because in this situation, like you see in this photo, uh, even if the child stops growing, gravity will keep pulling the child out, which means once your spine is decompensated, even if your curve is of a smaller magnitude, merely because of gravity, the curve will go on progressing uh, through time. And hence... Decompensation is an important, um, you know, definition in the ream of scoliosis. Um, just uh, FYI, all students should carry this plumb line with them during the exam. It's quite easy you to just take a rope and at the end tie a weight. So it uh, it's a line that always conforms to gravity and defines what is vertical. So it's very easy, but it's very impressive if you have it in your exam and you do get a scoliosis case. So here you have three different curves and... Uh, the one on the extreme left is a very high magnitude, but almost fully compensated curve. While the one in the center is uh, high magnitude and decompensated. And the one on the extreme right is high magnitude, but moderately decompensated, if you may. So it will tell you, it will uh, kind of cl clear your mind about uh, what is uh, compensation and decompensation. And incidentally, this phenomenon, whether, you know, where uh, there's such a big decompensation, this is called a truncal shift, which means that if you drew lines on the uh, edges of the of the pectoral girdle and of the pelvic girdle, there'll be a significant shift or an offset in these lines. And this is called a truncal shift, 
and a truncal shift actually matches with decompensation or is, is a extension of decompensation but also adds to the red flags of this curve okay so if you're not confused enough i'm here to confuse you more um, we talked about structural non-structural major minor we talked about compensated decompensated fractional curves um, we didn't talk about primary or secondary it's a primary curve and secondary curve is an obsolete terminology primary curve is a curve that was first noticed and secondary curve is a curve that was noticed later uh, it's it's an obsolete terminology because who noticed did you notice or your parent did the parents notice so uh, it's a very uh, you know ill defined terminology when you say a curve that was noticed first you can't rely on the you know on the person who noticed it or um, uh, anything such and hence uh, you we no longer use the terminology primary and secondary curve now let's come to what is called the strategic vertebrae in the ais and this is something that you got to know because um, uh, you will be asked this and if you just answer these these are you know five different names that i've thrown in there and they can get confusing to the novice when you you like you say n vertebra of course i know but ah uh, neutral vertebra now where does that come from and you start confusing all of them so i want to give some clarity but uh, per se uh, strategic vertebrae are vertebrae that make the deformity which means uh, uh, when you look at the spine like this you know that there's a number of bones that are you know involved in this it's like the cricket team right but you know that there are some game changers in this team like there are some people who you watch out for if you can get them out or if you can you know hit them for sixes you've taken the team out okay so strategic vertebrae are actually those vertebrae which actually make the deformity and if you can attack those vertebrae you can actually take care of the deformity and if you know everything about those vertebrae you probably have all the information you need about the deformity so these are the vertebrae that make the deformity obviously the first on the list would be the end vertebra and the simple definition of end vertebra is the maximally tilted vertebra on either end of the curve okay so if you just keep that in mind so end vertebra alludes to tilt nothing else tilt is just a coronal plane deformity and uh, so the vertebra which is on on the top end which is most tilted this would probably the upper end vertebra be the upper end vertebra of this main thoracic curve and this probably will be the lower end vertebra of the main thoracic curve right so uh, there's lots to discuss there but we need some feedback and hence since it's a one way didactic talk i'm not going to be asking you all questions but uh, it's very easy to ask you that if these two were equally tilted which one would you call the end vertebra so by definition the one that is closest to the apex of your curve becomes the end vertebra so if i had to add a caveat to this definition i will say the maximally tilted vertebra on either end of the curve which is closest to the apex of the curve that becomes the end vertebra because sometimes there are two vertebrae that are equally tilted all right so um, uh, that being done uh, if you cannot if you clearly like in in this uh, x ray i think there would be no debate everyone will agree that the in the main thoracic curve which is this curve um this bone seems most tilted because this starts tilting the other way i don't think there'll be any debate and on the lower end you i think most would agree that this looks most tilted however if there was a debate and if you're not able to uh, perceive that with your naked eye and your you know uh, eye brain coordination and if you start saying that look i think 7 seems to be as tilted as 8 so why is this confusion because of the detailing right if you had a microscope and you zoomed this out you would be quite quite sure but that possibility is not there so what we do is then we start we draw lines along the end plates and you will see these lines define the tilt of that bone so effectively if it's a very small angle between the two which you're not able to perceive with the naked eye you drag that to infinity and that tells you that that angle is much more prominent so the minute you draw these lines along the end plates you realize which bone is most tilted and um, that kind of tells you or uh, that kind of settles the controversy when there are two bones that seem to be equally tilted and it's a good idea to do it but if you can clearly see one bone more tilted than the other you don't have to draw lines to uh, to decide which is more tilted right now um, here's the deal that n vertebrae of a curve uh, remain the same forever okay so when you see a curve at presentation if you say that my upper end vertebra is t7 and lower end end vertebra is uh, t12 no matter what they those remain the end vertebra they are like the like the name given to the child when he was born that's not going to change 
whether the child is in India or in Bombay or in Bangladesh or in wherever else. Right. So, however, today we, uh, you know, do these bending x-rays and most people have a bending x-ray before they plan treatment. Now, when you do a corrective bending, for example, look at the film on the left, you'll agree that T8 is the upper end vertebra, but look at the uh, picture on the right, which is a corrective bending film. Uh, of course, T8 is not as tilted maybe as T7. T7 probably is more tilted in this. Uh, so now the new end vertebrae have probably, you know, gone up and down by one. So T7 and, uh, you know, T12, they become the new end vertebrae. And these end vertebrae, which are, uh, you know, are, which become the new end vertebrae on corrective bending x-rays, they can't be called end vertebrae because end vertebrae still remain the same. So in short, they are called intermediate vertebrae. So uh, the end vertebrae on the corrective bending film are called intermediate, upper and lower intermediate vertebrae. Okay, so once you have N vertebrae, they remain the same. And um, when you have the, your new assigned N vertebrae, the name for them is the intermediate vertebrae. And that's important because the segment between these two is the non-correctable segment. It's the part of the spine that's not, cha not, uh, that's not moving, that's stiff. And hence, it's called the stiff segment. And this is the area where the surgeon will have to work the most when he's doing surgery. The rest of it, just by mo uh, movement is going to correct. So it's not difficult to correct that. And you want to stack up more implants, do more osteotomies, etc. in that apex. Okay. So the end vertebrae on bending films are called intermediate vertebrae. I hope that's clear. So here are some examples of how the end vertebrae can actually change. All right. Now the next definition. So that's as far as end vertebrae go. And just as an exam question, I'd say uh, how many end vertebrae could be there in one single case of scoliosis. So here's a case of scoliosis on the bottom right. How many maximum end vertebrae could this have? So the correct answer is six because the, the, the proximal thoracic curve could have two, the main thoracic could have two and the lowest, uh, which is the thoracolumbar could have two and the minimum could be four. Because the lower end vertebra of your proximal thoracic could be the same as the upper end vertebra of your main thoracic. And the lower end vertebra of your main thoracic could be the same as the upper end vertebra of your thoracolumbar. So each spine could have four to six end vertebrae in them. When, if you can understand what I'm saying, then you're kind of clear about your definition of end vertebra, which is the maximally tilted vertebra. Now, the apical vertebra is the, is the next definition, exactly opposite that of uh, end vertebra. It's the least tilted vertebra, actually. Okay, so in, in a curve, the apex is the apical vertebra. And as you can imagine, that's where the, you know, spy, the vertebral body is most horizontal. So it is a maximally rotated, but the least tilted vertebra in the center of the curve. Right, so apical vertebra is alludes to apex, remember. And um, it obviously is the most deformed. Um, it is the least tilted. However, uh, one more definition is that it's the vertebra that's farthest from the CSVL, which is the central sacral vertebral line, which means that uh, when you draw a straight line from here in the, in the line of gravity, the vertebra that's farthest away from that line would be the apical vertebra. Now, sometimes in a case like this, uh, you would start uh, second guessing which of these is really the apical vertebra because they look quite similar similarly far away or similarly rotated. And um, when that confusion arises, the thing to do is, uh, you know, you draw, um, you know, draw a central sacral vertebral line, which is a vertical line that goes from the middle of the sacrum and uh, then draw a tangent to that. Uh, I mean, a parallel line to that, which is tangential to the curve and see where this line cuts the curve. And you will, you may find that in some situations, the line actually cuts the curve at the, disc level and hence in this particular scenario that disc this disc becomes the apex of the curve and then there are two apical vertebrae so uh, what i'm trying to impress upon you is that any curve could have an apical vertebra or an apical disc uh, spine that is an apical disc would then have two apical vertebrae this is important because apical vertebrae need to be instrumented when you're operating and uh, you, you need to know which is the apical vertebra also derotation has to happen there the most so if it is an apical disc and two apical vertebra, you could get one screw in each of these. If it was one apical vertebra, you'll have need two screws in that vertebra. So that's something that you want to take home with you. 
N vertebra most tilted, apical vertebra, the vertebra, the apex of the toe, neutral vertebra. So neutral alludes to rotation or lack of rotation. So the least rotated vertebra at the bottom of the curve or the most neutrally rotated vertebra on either end of the curve is the neutral vertebra. Like most tilted versus least rotated or neutrally rotated. Is that clear? Just keep that. Uh, of course, this lecture I'm going to send as a PDF version to Dr. Riday and uh, he can distribute it to you all. So it's yours for keeps. So you can go back and forth and, um, you know, try to go, go over these definitions. So you're all set. So don't bother if you, you know, don't bother taking notes down. If you are, it'll just be out there for open circulation. So neutral vertebra, uh, how do you know neutrality of a vertebra? You know this from Turek, the grades of rotation uh, described by Mo. So the problem here is that this is eyeballing and hence rotation does not become a very hard bound or uh, can't be written in stone. Like I may say that, oh, this looks grade two, but you may say, I think it's grade three. And it also depends on how the x-ray has been taken. And hence, it becomes slightly dodgy. But most spine surgeons agree that they are able to identify a neutrally rotated vertebra in a normal x-ray, uh, you know, almost 100 out of 100 times. And there's rarely, uh, you know, any controversy there. However, neutrality, uh, you know, you'd err towards more neutral than less neutral. For example, here, in this x-ray, you know, if you, someone may say that no, L uh, T12 also looks neutral. I think this finest process is pretty much in between these two. But L1 is severely neutral. More convincingly neutral. So then you would, I would err on L1 as the neutral. So you err on the more neutral than the less neutral if there's any controversy. So that, that makes life easy. Uh, it's easy to look at the vertebral body as a face of an owl. If the nose is right in the middle of the two eyes, it's not rotated. But if the nose is shifted off, then, uh, you know, the rotation is towards that side. Now, there's another definition called a stable zone. So, when you erect vertical lines along the sides of the sacro, uh, the L5-S1 joint, lumbosacral joint, uh, the zone in between this becomes a stable zone. And this is the zone in which your fusion should begin and should end. Uh, this was the original definition when... Um, you know, when surgery is involved, uh, distraction alone. Now, with very high correcting maneuvers, uh, you often find that once you correct the spine, a bone that was totally outside the stable zone actually comes into the stable zone. So, uh, this criteria no longer holds good, but it's always good to keep this as your fallback option because you may not be a skilled surgeon to correct scoliosis as much as someone else. So, as long as your lower instrumented vertebra is within the stable zone, and the upper is within the stable zone, there's a very low chance that your surgery will uh, top off one way or the other. Now, in this stable zone, the uh, vertebrae that lie in this stable zone are the stable vertebrae. But stable vertebra, a stable vertebra, so we talked about, about end vertebrae, we talked about apical vertebrae, we talked about neutral vertebra, least rotated. The stable vertebra is the vertebra that is best bisected by the CSVL or the central sacral vertical line closest to the curve. So, in this particular case, you'll see this one, which we are calling L1, is much better bisected than T12 and maybe even L2. So, uh, for the main thoracic curve here, this becomes a stable vertebra. And um, so, uh, stable alludes to its relation to the stable zone. The closer it is to the stable zone or in CSVL, the more you would call it a stable vertebra. And then that's the... You know, that's the uh, diagrammatic of if you didn't stop your fusion in the stable zone, because of gravity, the entire construct that you've, uh, you know, erected starts to fall off. And hence, it's prudent to stop your uh, construct within the stable zone. And then here's another truth that that has always, you know, that we've all grown up to, that once you identify the end, lower end vertebra, the stable vertebra, the neutral vertebra, the one that is the lowest amongst them should be your LIV or the lowest instrumented vertebra. If you follow this rule, you're largely safe. So sometimes, so usually the end vertebra is the highest, then the neutral and then the stable. Normally that is the sequence, but sometimes there's a mis mismatch. Whichever is the lowest should be the, you know, your error of your LIV. Right. So uh, we spoke about these, just revise them quietly in your head. Before we move on, end vertebrae, intermediate vertebrae, which is the end vertebrae on bending films, apical vertebra, which is the apex of the curve. It's the least rotated but most deformed vertebra. Stable vertebra is a vertebra that's best bisected by the central sacral vertebral line at the bottom of the curve. 
and the neutral vertebra is the least rotated vertebra at the bottom of the curve. Right? So once you know these definitions, quickly we'll move on to how you take a history uh, in the exam. So they're very specific questions. I mean, you want to ask the history of presenting complaints, the history of uh, you know uh, progress of the presenting complaints. You want to ask about associated negative histories. So follow the standard format. But what you want to definitely bring out is the age, because age is very, very relevant. The younger the child, the more likely the curve is going to progress. Uh, growth spurt, when did the child uh, attain puberty or menarche? If you're able to ask that, that makes sense. You want to ask the birth history. Was it a normal delivery? Was it twins? Was there a you know, uh, delayed labor? Because that tells you about neuromuscular syndromic, etc. Neuromuscular because cerebral palsy, syndromic because syndromic. Uh, brothers and sisters, do they have the deformity? Though it's extremely rare to find... Uh, the same deformity in two kids, but recently, for example, I operated uh, three uh, Iraqi kids, you know, three triplets uh, with the same deformity. So it's not unknown and uh, uh, you may want to ask about this. Uh, you want to ask when the curve was first noticed. So if it, it was noticed at birth, it's obviously not AIS. It's not obviously not idiopathic scoliosis. Typically, idi idiopathic scoliosis gets noticed in the first or ideally the second growth spurt, which is in the early teens or maybe 10, 11 years of age. If it's been noticed at the age of four or five, it's most likely not an idiopathic scoliosis. And you, then you want to also ask the history of progression that after, since you notice it, has it grown rapidly or uh, has it been slowly growing? And has the child grown rapidly in height or not? So you also ask them for complaints and why, ha why have I put this in bold? Because none of the, uh, you know, no cases of AIS would have any of these complaints. So if your child with the scoliosis gives any of these complaints, uh, it probably is not NAIS and you'll have to start thinking out of the box. But surely you want to ask why the AIS child has come to you because you may end up saying that, okay, she's come here for cosmesis or she's come here for the deformity. But I'd like to hear what aspect of the deformity actually bothers her. Is it a one shoulder high? Is it the neck tilt? Is it the rib hump? Is it the flat chest on the concave side? Is it the truncal asymmetry? Is it a pelvic shift? What actually bothers her? And it would be great if you can ask, ask the child or the parents that this history that, okay, kamar teda hai, but aapko isme se konsa cheez, uh, specifically aapko kharab lagta hai. Isme se konsi cheez ke wajay se aapko, why, why, what's bothering you? If you can ask that, then you, you're in a position to see the deliverables, which means are you, are you as a surgeon able to address that? So it's always impressive to tell your, uh, tell your examiner that this child has come with the chief complaint of a deformity and she's most bothered by the right-sided rib hump uh, or she's most bothered by the tilted shoulders or whatever else. So ask what concerns the patient the most. Uh, always ask for any other complaints because um, you know the, the triad of uh, kidney and heart and uh, uh, especially if it's a non-idiopathic scoliosis, you probably want to get a 2D echo, you want to get an MRI scan done because you want to see if there's a neural, neural axial anomaly. And then, of course, look at the kidneys. Uh, uh, again, sonography for the kidney. Uh, AIS examination, what do you see for in the clinic? You always want to uh, ideally disrobe the child, but it can become very embarrassing sometimes to disrobe the child. You can ask for the nurse to come in. You can make them wear a gown or a shirt and just unbutton from the back. So as long as the entire back is disrobed, I think it's uh, reasonably okay in an Indian scenario. Um, you want to see the natal cleft. So you want to go all the way down. So you want to see how those curves match up. Uh, you ideally want to see the shoulders better than what is seen on this picture. Uh, in this picture, the t-shirt covers the shoulder. So though you can on this picture say, well, the shoulders look at they are the same height. You will uh, now know that there's something called a lateral shoulder balance and a medial shoulder balance. And that's the trapezius fullness. Right, And we'll just come, I think I'll touch upon that in one of the slides. So when you examine the patient from top to bottom, these are all the 10 things that you want to cover. You want to cover the neck tilt. You want to see which trapezius looks more full. You want to look at the medial and lateral shoulder asymmetry or height. You want to look at the chest deformity from the front and from the back. You want to look at the arm trunk distance. For example, in the concave side, the arm trunk distance is significantly more than the convex side. You'll also notice that the arm looks rotated internally on the convex side, while here it looks rotated externally. Um, so it looks thinner on the one side and thicker on one side. You want to look at truncal shift. We spoke about that. What's the pectoral girdle doing in relation to the pelvic girdle? You want to look at the flank crease. So many kids, especially Indian girls, are um, you know more worried about the uh, flank crease asymmetry rather than the rib hump. 
because the uh, Indian clothes often expose the midriff, like a sari, and then that becomes like the cosmetic, uh, you know, problem for them rather than the, uh, you know, the rib hump which is well covered. You look at the pelvic tilt. Uh, what shows you the pelvic tilt is really where the dimple of Venus is. So the PSIS, if it uh, looks offset, that means there's probably a pelvic tilt. Those are that's the dimple of Venus or the uh, the grooves of the PSIS. You want to look at the limb length and the uh, attitude of the limb. So if the child is standing with a one knee flexed, obviously there's something else going on, like a limb length discrepancy, and you go to examine the child. And then uh, you want to look at, of course, the standard neurological examination because it should be normal in an AIS child. Uh, you always examine these kids standing, sitting, as well as lying down. So a school, again, this is an exam question. Um, if, if scoliosis, which is apparent when the child is standing, reduces when the child sits down, uh, the more you, you will have to think about a sub-pelvic or a lower half, you know, a lower limb discrepancy, limb length discrepancy as one of the etiologies of the scoliosis. Because the minute you put the legs out of the equation, and you level the pelvis when the child sat at the edge of the table, the scoliosis corrected. Means it's an infra-pelvic cause of the scoliosis, basically. And if the scoliosis remains even when the child sits, but goes away when the child lies down, it's probably a pain-related cause of scoliosis, like a list or a spasmodic scoliosis in an acute disc. Because as soon as the child lies, lies down, the spine is offloaded, and the ill effect of the disc goes away and the muscle spasm settles. Right, so this is again a reinforcement slide. Just remember those eight or 10, uh, 10 things that we discussed here and make sure all of these are spoken about when you talk about the examination of the scoliosis. That's the trapezius fullness, that's the arm trunk distance, lower limb attitude. You want to make the child bend forward to look at the rib hump. Uh, ideally, we uh, all have in our uh, telephones the goinometer, which is actually, it's like a, it tells you, it's like a scoliometer. So just place your telephone like this and it'll tell you how many degrees is the rib hump. And that's, that's made it easy. And back in the day, we would use what is called the two textbook method. So once the child bends forward, you put two horizontal textbooks and then you measure the distance and say this is the rib, uh, size of the rib hump. Um, you want to examine the curve, like what is the flexibility of the curve when you by side tilting, by forward and backward flexion. So if, a, uh, if there's a significantly prominent rib hump on bending forward, you would say that the curve is still mobile in rotation, which means the rotation is uh, further increasing, actually exaggerating. If the curve corrects a lot on lateral bending, uh, you would say it's a flexible curve. If a curve corrects a lot on suspension, it's either a neuromuscular curve because the you know suspension takes the muscles out of the line of, of, of the you know equation, or probably it's a low hanging apex. So if the main thoracic curve has a low apex. Uh, instead of bending, whether there'll be a rib or a costo pelvic impingement when you bend if the curve is low slung, uh, traction or a suspension would uh, display the you know correctability better. You want to examine the child sitting, lying down. You do want to examine the gait because a short limb gait or an antalgic gait could be a giveaway to this being not being an AIS. And then, of course, you want to examine the neurology. Um, there are maturity or growth potential markers and, uh, you know, Normally in the clinic, we just say, did she, when did she grow or when did she shoot up in height? When was her menarche? I mean, you don't then go to, uh, because you don't have radiology at this point when you're examining the child. But you do want to ask these questions uh, in pertinence to how much growth is still left in the child. I mean, that, that's the reason why you want to ask these specific questions. Uh, the red flags for progression. So uh, what is the chance that this will progress rapidly? The red flags would be a younger patient, a patient whose uh, reserve is still not, you know, the iliac crest is still not being seen on the uh, x-ray. Uh, females, if there's a family history, if there's a core angle greater than 20 degrees at presentation, if the rotation is more than, uh, you know, three, um, if it's double, a double major curve because of gravity, it tends to, you know, get worse. And if the RVAD, which is the rib vertebral angle difference, is more than 20 degrees. You all know what that is, is the angle that the rib makes with the bone. And uh, when you calculate the one of the convex and the concave side, it basically, if that angle is more than 20, uh, the chance of progression is higher. And this uh, RVAD, no, no one no, no longer looks at, but it's of historic importance because the person who described this was an Indian lady, a lady orthopedic surgeon from UK, Min Mehta. And uh, hence, it's one of our contributions to scoliosis. And at that time, when you know, the other uh, other markers were not there. Even the reserve sign was just about there. This RVAD was one of the major methods of 
knowing if the child is going to progress. And hence, you should know this rib vertebral angle difference of min metta. And it's always measured at the apex of your curve, at the apical vertebra, the difference between the angle made by the rib and the vertebra on one side versus the other is what is RVAD. Now, what x-rays do you ask for? You ask for three foot standing films. If you don't have these, you can do three different films and stitch them together, but they have to be standing films. They have to be upright films. There's no role of lying down films in um, your first assessment of scoliosis. And you estimate the coronal balance. You uh, then ask for the standing lateral film to look at the sagittal balance. And um, you know, once you see that on the x-ray, you identify the apical vertebra, the end vertebra of your curves, uh, the, the three curves that you have actually, and then um, and measure the angle. And then at the bottom, you can see the reserve sign. And if you're doing well, you can actually comment on that also. So when you see the x-ray after this case discussion is done, then the examiner says, okay, so what uh, test do you want? And you say, I'd like a standing AP x-ray. And you should know why it's standing AP because gravity has a big role to play in scoliosis. And a lying down x-ray will totally undervalue the scoliosis and you'll make wrong decisions. The true visibility of the scoliosis when the child is standing. So it has to be a standing x-ray. And uh, you talk about, uh, you know, what you see on the x-ray. You say, I can see one major curve or uh, the main thoracic seems like the major curve. Or you may say there are two major curves. And you, you can tell, you know, which you think are the end vertebrae, which are the apical vertebrae. And uh, then you can also comment on the reserve grade if you know it yourself. Um, after this, you try to measure the stable vertebra by drawing the lines. If you don't have this uh, luxury in the surge in your uh, exam, you can just put in a straight line and try and you know figure out which is the. So you don't need to draw these lines. Just put in a vertical or put your plumb line in and see which is the stable vertebra. So it, the examiner will be impressed if you know that. I'm sorry, I'm going back. Is that a lot of heavy dose for you? But it's all important and. Once you know this, and like I said, you're going to have this lecture uh, in your pocket in, a, in some time, you will have finished scoliosis. You don't need to then read anything on scoliosis as far as your exam case is concerned, right? So then you look for bending film. So then your examiner will say, okay, doctor, now that you have the AP film and the lateral film, what uh, else do you need? Assuming that you're planning to uh, advise surgery to your patient, you would want to do bending films. If not, it's not critical to do bending films because bending films don't define the curve. They define the area of fusion. They, they are not needed to uh, you know, know, define the type of scoliosis you have. But when you talk of correction, if you don't have bending films, you may make wrong decisions. So these bending films incidentally should be done lying down. They are supine bending. They are not standing bending because when you stand and bend, there's a telescoping that will come in the way of correct bending. Also, the muscles are taut and hence they will not allow as much bending as you could otherwise get. And hence, bending films and scoliosis are always supine and ideally assisted or supervised, which means that one of the doctors from the team should go there and make sure that is being done correctly. Because, the you know, it's quite common to have poorly, um, poorly created bending films because the technician didn't know how to do it. And then when there's a low apex of your main thoracic curve, like in this case, Imagine if you if you try to do a bending film, this rib is going to straight away hit that ilium. So it's not going to represent how much bending is happening because for a vicarious or an unrelated cause, the bending is going to be subdued. So you do what is called a traction film. And this again has to be done by the doctors in the team. One person, the patient is lying down, one person puts the arms under the show, under the armpits and with the forearms pulls the child and the other one is actually pulling down on the thighs or if thighs are too bulky, then at the ankle of the child. So you do a full traction and then take an AP x-ray. Um, you want to look at pelvic obliquity and limb length discrepancy. And in the end, when you finally give your diagnosis, you cover all these. The etiology, whether it's left, right, convex, single or double major, compensated or decompensated, which means that in this case, I would say that, uh, so finally, sir, uh, lady girl XYZ, who's a 12-year-old girl, comes with a most likely diagnosis of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis uh, convex to the right, which is a single major curve, which looks compensated with the most likely uh, upper and lower end vertebra being XYZ uh, with a likely core angle of um, so many degrees. Uh, she is hypokyphotic in the main thoracic spine. Uh, there is a rotation leading to a rib hump and the curve seems inflexible, uh, rigid. Uh, she is 12 years old and attained menarche last year. 
and uh, her pelvic uh, there is no pelvic obliquity and the limb lengths are equal so if you cover this in one one diagnostic line as your final diagnosis there is almost nothing for left for the examiner to ask you because everything is covered um so this is one way that you can actually present your scoliosis case now rude should we stop here or go ahead i know it's uh, because if there's only one i mean we gone on for so 45 almost, minutes or, yeah 45 minutes we almost covered all the basic aspects uh, for orthopedic residents that needs to be done and the rest you can distribute on the because the lecture has everything yes, up everything. Yeah, yeah yeah so we can just distribute that to everyone what do you say yes 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 just the last slide that you uh, were displaying the, i think that is one thing that we can finish off non idiopathic so what are uh, what are non idiopathic yeah what are the uh, markers of non idiopathic non idiopathic yeah that i think that could be the last slide before we end so there you go so they may ask you this that when when would you say that this is not idiopathic or when would you ask for an mri today we were asked for an mri for all cases of scoliosis but these are the red flags which uh, suggest that the curve that you're dealing with is non idiopathic so it's a younger child it's a left convex curve it's a male child there's a rap- history of rapid progression of the curve there are of course skin signs there's neurology or limb length discrepancy there are symptoms like pain and then there are other systemic anomalies or there's a strong family history if any of this is there you have to think of this as a non idiopathic even though it looks like an idiopathic and then on detail examination and uh, investigations you may find out that this is actually non idiopathic so i think with that uh, we can stop i'm going to share with you the rest of the presentation which i'm running through uh, which will then you know talk about what are the classification methods and what are the basic management principles before you actually you know come to uh, finally identify the type of scoliosis look for the red flags examine your patient examine the, the curve discuss the patient expectations before you actually plan the management so i hope i've covered a lot of ground uh, and i hope it's not been too confusing and i'm available on email and uh, through dr riday and uh, dr harshil if there are any questions you know leading up in the future thank you thank you sir uh, it was an amazing lecture i think a lot of uh, things which most of the resident doctors forget to cover or are missed out during exams have been covered so it was a very interesting session most of the basic concepts have been clear so thank you so much sir for sparing uh, time for the lecture thank you thank you very much sir we shall stop then hmm? yes 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 sir. done yes thank, thank you. you thank you sir.